what we're trying to do is to g dig into the world of quantum computing, quantum networks, uh, a bit more, uh, not from a necessarily a deep technical perspective, but where the field is, what its likelihoods are, and trying to understand a little bit of it for people that are deeply involved in it. And um, uh, so I'd like to start out with uh, maybe uh, asking uh, what's the uh, involvement of KO uh, in the, the quantum computing field? Ah, okay. So KO has been involved in quantum computing since at least the early 2000s, the very early 2000s. I came in as a PhD student in 2003, and I had two advisors, one in computer science and one in applied physics. And my applied physics professor was Kohei Ito, who went on to become the dean of the, of the Graduate School of Science and Technology. And his background is originally material science, but he'd been doing quantum computing for already a number of years when I, when I arrived. He was, in fact, the reason I came to KO in order to get my PhD for that. So we've been doing it now for, I would guess, 20 years. And of course, there have been a number of individual professors who have been working in the area, and we've all had our own research groups, and we've done various things. In the spring of 2018, we actually created the KO Quantum Computing Center. And Kohei and our professor, Naoki Yamamoto, um, Naoki is the head of the, the, the KO Quantum Computing Center, and I'm the vice chair of, of the, uh, the center. So um, we now have a formal structure, and we've got professional staff, and we also have member companies who are, who are participating with us, and they, have, they send researchers to work with us at KO uh, on this. And the companies that we have are Mitsubishi, UFG, the, the financial group, Mizuho Financial Group, Mitsubishi Chemical, and JSR, which is another one of the big chemical companies. So there's a big effort at, at KO. Okay. Quantum computing is advertised as solving all problems and creating <laughs> all problems. Uh, it's going to solve uh, the decoding of cryptographic information. It's going to solve major problems, etc. Uh, in the computing area, we tend to go through these uh, episodes of we're about to revolutionize the world, and sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. Uh, what's the state of quantum computing now? Well, the first thing to know is that quantum computers aren't going to solve everything. You're not going to have a quantum laptop that's running quantum Microsoft Word <laughs> anytime in the foreseeable future. Quantum computers instead are going to be adjunct processors for, for classical computers like coprocessors. You and I are old enough to remember the days of a separate coprocessor box that connected to your workstation or your mainframe that was specialized for doing certain types of like computations. Harvest. Yeah, like Harvest or like any of the array processors right. that were used for scientific computing, thing, things right. like that. The modern version of that is the GPU that's inside, inside your laptop, but that's very, very tightly coupled to the existing uh, CPU. So quantum computers are going to be like that outside box that connects to it, and you're running a classical program for a particular purpose, and then you hit a particularly difficult computational portion of that, you hand that problem to, to the quantum computer, you let it run, then you get an answer back, and then you incorporate it and you go on. So the structure of the algorithm is classical, but within that there are parts of it that, that are quantum, and so the quantum computer will behave as this, as this coprocessor. What, what parts of conventional computing if, or conventional problems would be susceptible to quantum solutions? The original proposal by Richard Feynman, who was a professor at Caltech, um, I studied under him. I took one of his classes when I was an undergrad at, at Caltech. That was in 1985-86, which happened to be the year that the Challenger uh, space shuttle blew up, and so he wasn't present for a lot of it. But at that same time, he was working on the foundations of what we call quantum computing today. And his original proposal for this was that it could be used for simulating other quantum systems. So for solving problems in quantum chemistry, for example. So what's the, 
the bond length between two atoms in a, in a molecule, or what are the vibrational modes, or what are the energy levels in molecules, things like that. That was the original proposal in the early 1980s. Um, it generated sort of basic academic interest, but then in 1994, a guy named Peter Shore, who was a few years ahead of me at Caltech, but wasn't somebody I knew, um, by then he was a researcher at AT&T, uh, AT and, and he proposed an algorithm for factoring large numbers using quantum computers. And if you can do that, you can solve public key cryptography and possibly Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which are two of the foundational ways that we go about organizing communications uh, on uh, the internet. And so it got a whole lot of people excited and interested. So we've got quantum chemistry, we've got some effects on cryptography. Um, those were two of the original interest areas. Um, a third, you'll hear people talk about quantum database search, and that was created by a guy named Love Grover, but I don't really like the term database search because it's not really, there's not like a, a terabyte or, or, or many terabytes of data that, that, that you're searching through. What you're doing, in effect, is trying to invert a function. Given a function and a number or an output, what value of the input would make the, the output become this number? And so it's, it's useful in that sense. Um, the other kinds of things that people more recently have been working on, they've been working on graph algorithms, they've been working on various algorithms which are supposed to support AI in uh, some, some various and sundry ways. Um, they've gone back to the chemistry problem and developed new algorithms for, for, for doing quantum chemistry. Um, AI is maybe an interesting example because today when we talk about AI stuff, we're talking about a lot about uh, you know, the, the subfield called machine learning where a lot of that is you take tons and tons and tons of data and you feed it into a system and you let it learn about that data. So you give it a million pictures of cats, and so it learns to recognize cats. That takes a lot of data. Quantum computers have a weakness with respect to big data. The machines themselves have very small capacity in terms of, of their own data size. We talk about that in terms of the number of qubits that are in a system. And we're still talking about tens of qubits in the existing systems. Um, and there's not a good way to input large amounts of data into the systems. So a better range of fields is problems that have uh, you know, what we call algorithmically a high branching factor. So for example, chess or go or shogi, um, the amount of data it takes to represent the state of the board is small, but the computation grows exponentially as you go. So as it happens, those problems have a certain amount of internal structure, and so we've been able to build classical systems that do very well on them. So they're not really a case where, where a quantum computer would necessarily have a provable advantage, but that's the kind of problem that we want. You know, something with a small state space, but a large growth in the amount of computation that's required. Which somewhat sounds like some of the financial areas also. Well, so actually, as I mentioned, there are a couple of financial groups that are involved in the KO Quantum Computing Center, and they're interested in quantum computing for a couple of reasons. One, of course, is the impact on computer security, because financial companies care a great deal about online security. And the other is that global financial regulators have been increasing the stringency of regulations around uh, risk analysis. And so they want to know, given your investment portfolio, Hopefully the probability that you're going to crater the entire planet's economy is small. How small is it? That's what they want to know. And so this is a risk analysis for portfolios, and you're looking for this small tail in a probability distribution, and there are proposed quantum algorithms for assessing that. And so some of the people who are part of the KO Quantum Computing Center are working on extending those algorithms and figuring out how to apply them in the real world. There, there's a um, belief somehow in, in some areas that quantum computing is going to revolutionize the world tomorrow morning. <laughs> right? uh, you know, there, there's been in the past in the computing area many of these, uh, we're about to revolutionize the world and sometimes it happens. Uh, probably microelectronics was one of the 
early days where it did, in fact, revolutionize the world. How close are we to actually being able to do that, say, in the computing aspects of quantum? Wow, that's a really good question. <laughs> Just a few weeks ago, there was a news article written by a, a science uh, reporter um, who said, quantum supremacy is coming, it's not going to change the world. This resulted in a long discussion on Twitter and some interesting things have, have come out of that. But the fundamental point that she's making there is actually right. Basically, we are at the point where quantum computers can start doing things that classical computers cannot, but that doesn't mean that they're useful yet. So in fact, we are recording this, today is September 24th, 2019, right? and the reason this date is important is just under a week ago, on about the 19th, give or take, a paper appeared briefly on the internet in NASA's archives that says that Google has done what they call quantum supremacy. And it's a draft of a paper, and it was withdrawn fairly quickly, but copies of, of the, the paper had already gotten out. Rumor has it the paper has passed peer review and it's in press now and so it will probably appear in either nature or science sometime in the next few weeks. Maybe by the time people are actually watching this video we're actually creating here. So what is it? What's happened? Google is claiming that their, their quantum computer can do something that nobody else in the world can do. Well, the problem that they are solving is taking a random circuit or a random quantum algorithm and sampling from the output distribution of this. So um, in classical computer science, in theoretical computer science, we have a range of problems that are called satisfiability problems. So you take a set of logic gates that are arranged in some particular fashion, maybe, maybe even randomly using AND and OR and NOT gates, and your challenge as the person who's solving the problem is to find a set of input values for this circuit that will result in this whole thing cascading down and resulting in a one that comes out at the end of it. Right. It's called a satisfiability problem, and they're known to be hard problems, classically. Google's kind of doing the same thing with this, except that the output that comes out of this is not just a single binary number, not even for all of the qubits in it, the, what comes out of this is a, is a set of qubits that are in quantum superposition or quantum in, uh, entanglement, if the thing works right. And when you measure the results of that, sometimes you get zero, sometimes you get one, depending on the characteristics of this superposition and this entanglement that's in it. So the system as a whole is set up so that what you get is a probability distribution. And Google is sampling from that probability distribution. Okay, so what does that mean, right? It means that they run their quantum computer a million times and a million times they get the, some of the results out of it, um, but with 53 qubits, which is the number they're running with it, the total possible number of answers, values that you could get out of it is two to the 53, just like you would have with, with classical bits, which is about 10 to the 16. So they're running it a million times, but the state space is 10 to the 16, so any individual answer you should get one time out of 10 billion or something. Except that because there's quantum entanglement and superposition inside of this, that distribution of what you get out should have certain statistical characteristics, and Google is testing those. So that's a long explanation. What does it mean? What it means is that Google is demonstrating that they have built a machine that behaves in a quantum fashion and classical machines can't behave like this. Their machine works. Right. Ah, okay. So their machine works. Um, winding back, <laughs> you asked, when will machines be useful, <laughs> right? Right. I don't know. Um, soon, we hope, right? <laughs> soon, we hope. Um, Peter Shor's algorithm for factoring People were very interested at the beginning. Our understanding of what, what it took to build a machine that would solve this was very naive when, when, when the algorithm was originally proposed. Um, that was 25 years ago this year. 
Uh, I started working on this, and my PhD thesis was actually on how hard this is to, to solve or not. My PhD thesis was 2006, so it's more than halfway back to the beginning of, of this at this point. Um, but we know that the machines are going to be really hard to build, they're going to be really big, they require a lot of error correction, and they require very high fidelity, very high quality components. So Shor's algorithm's not going to be changing the world within the next five to 10 years for certain, 10 to 20, maybe. Um, but there is now an entire research field in quantum algorithms that will run correctly on noisy computers. So there's a guy named John Preskill, who's a professor at Caltech, who created the term two years ago now, I guess it was two years ago now, uh, NISQ, or NISQ, Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum Systems. And so the question is, are these NISQ machines going to actually be useful? And part of what we have to do is we have to figure out how to subdivide the problems so that you're running as much as possible on the classical side and depending on the quantum machine as little as possible. But these kinds of hybrid machines are probably going to solve some interesting and useful problems within the next five to seven years, I would say. Um, that requires advances in both the hardware and in the software for, for subdividing these problems, but it also requires probably some pure theoretical advances as well. Uh, there's a, I think some of the work that, that you've done and some of the work others have done is dealing with quantum networks, mm -hmm. uh, which sounds um, like it's closer, mm -hmm. uh, although the hype is about as high as it is for quantum computing. What's the realistic, where are we in that? Because that could have short-term benefits if we can do it. Yeah. So applications of the quantum internet, I divide them into to three big areas. One area is cryptographic functions, right. and one area is what I call broadly sensor networks, and one area is distributed computing. So distributed quantum computing, just like we have distributed classical computing. So you've got those three potential areas. Um, the goal of a quantum internet is to make what we call this quantum entanglement over a distance ideally spread in various places around the world as, as we build it. Um, but again, you have to have a certain data rate and a certain fidelity to do, uh, to do interesting things with this. Fidelity is essentially the probability that, that, that it does what, what you asked it to do, the probability that it does that correctly. The data rates for these three areas and the fidelities that you need vary. Um, the first and most obvious application of all, of all of this is what we call quantum key distribution, which comes back to the cryptography stuff. Um, quantum key distribution itself, the way it's actually structured, in my opinion, is, kind of sits on the border between these cryptographic functions and sensor networks, because the, what, what it's really doing is it's really testing your network to see if somebody is eavesdropping on your conversation. So it's a sensor network that's testing for the presence or absence of, of, a, uh, of an eavesdropper. When it works right, and when there's no eavesdropper, what you get you know, between you and me, if we were connecting uh, via, via this network, is we get a set of shared secret classical bits, a set of zeros and ones that are random, and then we can use that for classical encryption across, right. across the network. So people are very interested in this QKD. It has existed, and there have been startup companies building and selling devices that do this for close to 20 years. But the first generations of machines were used single photons and were limited in distance to a few tens of kilometers, and you had to connect them directly over a dark fiber that wasn't used for anything else, and there's no way to store the data, and the data rates were low, and the boxes were expensive, and you have to figure out how to integrate them into your overall network. So the, the, the business has been slow. Developing the business has been slow. And the, the first generation couldn't go multiple hops in a secure fashion and extend across the entire globe. What my research group is doing, and other research groups are doing, is we're working on what are called quantum repeaters. And those quantum repeaters are not like classical repeaters. They're not just amplifying a signal. They're more like the routers that are in the classical internet. And so once we have these things built, then we can program them and 
run distributed quantum algorithms on top of them and do interesting things with them. That's what we're trying to do with the quantum internet. Okay. When's that going to be available? Well, you know, I've started working on quantum repeaters, I guess, in late 2006 or early 2007. And part of the reason I started working on them was because we thought, wow, quantum computers are really hard and they're really far, far away. Maybe these repeaters are a little bit easier. But it turns out that building quantum repeaters has basically all of the same problems as building quantum computers, plus the problems of converting your qubits or your data from whatever your machine is inside to photons that you can transmit across the, the network and then collecting those and doing something interesting with them. So in some ways, it's the same set of problems as building a quantum computer plus some. But hopefully that we'll be able to do this with smaller scale machines and therefore we'll have some interesting things to do with it. So technology-wise, where are we? I would say standalone quantum computers are actually likely to become useful before the quantum internet itself does. Okay. Uh, you, ra you raised the question which is long-term interesting. And that's the notion of distributed processing. Mm. Uh, you know, I have a long history in distributed processing, which I won't go into here. But uh, That's how you got involved with the people here at KO, I know. That's <laughs> how I got involved with the people at KO, and that's correct, especially Professor Iso. Uh, but uh, as time has gone on, more and more we're, we're living in a world where we're using distributed computing, which, which has the effect of being able to give you access to incredible computing power without having to own it. Uh, with all the benefits and some of the negatives of it. Uh, I would assume that given the cost of quantum computing and the facilities, that it will have to evolve that way. And in order to get there, you'd have to have quantum networks so you can connect your little, <laughs> I'm not sure what to even call it, access point to the, to the thing. Where are we there? So I always ask hard questions. Yeah. The KO Quantum Computing Center, through our relationship with IBM, we're already using IBM's existing quantum computers. And IBM is building a data center right now by, within, within the next few months, they'll have a total of 10 machines that are available for, uh, for us to use, of different sizes and capabilities. Those machines are all in New York. We're using them today. How do we use them today? Well, we connect to them across the classical internet. Right. We run a little program on our laptop and it connects to the machine over there and queues a job to, to the machines right. in, in New York and we get something back. So what's, what's the big deal? What do we need the, cla the quantum internet for? The classical internet already connects us to, to quantum, quantum servers in a remote location like the early days of the ARPANET. What's the big deal? If we build entanglement between our small quantum computer that we have here and a large mainframe quantum computer that, that's over there, what do we get that we can't get just by connecting to, 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 to that machine over the classical internet? Well, today, what we do is we write a program and we send it to a server computer at IBM and that server computer controls the, the quantum computer and, the, and sends its results back. That means IBM knows what program we're running and IBM knows what our input data is and what our output data is. Which is a no-no. That's fine if we trust IBM. And IBM's a trustworthy company. Right. I don't mean to, to say anything negative about IBM. But in principle, it would be nice if we could ask them to compute something for us without sharing information with them. That's what's called blind quantum computation. And that was a pro proposed more than a decade ago now by uh, Anne Broadbent, Elam Kashefi, and uh, Joe Fitzsimons. And at sort of the one qubit level, it's actually been demonstrated in the laboratory, but you know, one qubit level is not, not a particularly interesting computation yet. But the idea is basically that we entangle our machine with their machine, and then we measure our set of the qubits. And the qubits that we have over here basically tell us the parity between our system and their system. And if we keep that information secret, then IBM, whatever they do, has no idea what the, the numbers that come out of the machine mean. Okay. It's like you know, 
like a one-time pad almost in that what we're getting is completely random and we can just use those, those bits to decode the, the classical results that IBM sends back to us. Um, so the, with blind quantum computation, the server side learns nothing about the input data, nothing about the output results, and even nothing about the actual algorithm that's being run except an upper, upper bound on the size of the algorithm because they know how much work they were asked to do. That's it. So it's, it's an incredibly exciting idea for doing real quantum computation in a distributed fashion. The catch is, once again, it takes high fidelity and high data rates to do it. And we are working on figuring out ways to bring that down by you know, orders of magnitude so that we can make this whole thing practical. And another possibility is what, which you do now in some cases is you have two large compute or multiple large computing centers uh, or computing complexes which are connected and work on a common problem. So it's a scaling mm -hmm. issue. If you have if you have 10,000 machines and I have 10,000 machines, what we'd like is to work on a common problem. That's hard, even conventional machines. But uh, you know, it's certainly a direction to go given if we can ever get there. Exactly, and you can do that in a laboratory the size of this room. It doesn't have right. to be across the planet. If we have two quantum computers sitting next to each other and we want them to cooperate to solve a, a shared problem, there is a proof that if their only connection is classical, then they can't solve a problem larger than, than the capability of the better of the two machines. So if you want them to actually collaborate to, to solve a larger problem yeah, in, a, in, a, in a real multi-computer fashion, then you have to have, have to be able to create quantum entanglement between the two of them, so you need a system area network. And in fact, that's what my PhD thesis was about, was, okay. was the design of a quantum multi-computer and how we might do this in a distributed fashion. Let me switch to, a, suppose we have um, quantum computing, and suppose that we can scale it up to reasonable sizes. How the hell do we program it? <laughs> You're asking the, 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 the hard questions. You're right. You like to ask hard questions. Um, today, IBM has a, a front end that we can use through a web browser. There are actually two front ends. One is just a GUI where you can drag and drop a handful of gates. It's like being able to program AND and OR gates for, for something simple using a GUI. That's very limited in terms of the scalability of the overall thing. Um, the other approach is that you can write programs in a set of libraries that build on top of the Python programming language called Qiskit, Q-I-S-K-I-T. Um, IBM supports Qiskit. That's open source. You can, uh, anybody can contribute to it. We have contributed to it. Um, there's a startup company called Rigetti, and they have a, also a Python-based programming environment called uh, PyQuill. Um, Google has their own pro programming environment. But all of these today are still, even though they're programming languages, they are still operating at essentially the level of assembly language. You, know, you specify right. one gate at a time. And just like with classical com computers, if you want to talk about an elaborate data structure like a uh, B plus tree or, or a particular graph structure or something, trying to think in terms of the assembly code to do this means that you're not really connecting the ideas that are in your brain to, to what's happening in the computer. You need a higher level language. You need a higher level set of paradigms or tools for doing this. And that's actually an important area of research. And I have a PhD student who's just starting, uh, who's going to be working on that. The real key to quantum algorithms is not just the set of gates and not just this entanglement, but interference patterns. So just like when you have sound waves that, that are echoing around within, within a room or you see waves at the beach, when the waves come together, in some places they add up, in other places they, they, they cancel out, that's constructive interference and destructive interference. The core of a quantum algorithm is constructing interesting interference patterns that represent the solution to your problem. So it's very different from the normal sort of 
loop-based and if-based kinds of programming that we do with, with a classical system. So I believe we need programming tools that help develop and support the programmer's intuition for how to build those interference patterns, and that doesn't exist today. You don't, you know, we don't have the, I date myself, we don't have the Fortran. <laughs> um, in fact, things like Fortran transition from assembly language, which we all loved and hated at the same time, to approaches that a, a person who wasn't familiar with all the bits mm -hmm. could actually work on. And that scaled things rapidly and for scaling. Uh, in some areas, it was never obvious how to do that. Uh, I remember back then, I played around a little with the harvest machines. And you know, there wasn't really, at least publicly available, a reasonable way of talking about a very complex interaction of large amounts of data trying to break codes or whatever you did with them. Uh, and until, we, until you achieved that level, it wasn't exactly a tool that was available for a large number of users. Let me, um, also operating, but your, your point is well taken that uh, when you consider that the, um, probably the ultimate you, uh, direction is going to be quantum add-ons to conventional computing. Conventional computing does things correctly in a certain area, and quantum computing hopefully can do it correctly in another area, and the mix of those two is, the, is potentially very powerful. Uh, how do you know, by the way, whether the quantum computing, quantum computer is actually doing it correctly? <laughs> that depends on, of course, the algorithm that you're running. Right. If you're running the factoring algorithm, Shor's factoring algorithm, we know that, well, we believe, we don't even really know, we believe that actually finding those two factors is a hard problem. But once you have found those two factors, you can just take the two of them and you can multiply them together to see if, to see if you get the result right. out. And so you know whether the computation right. succeeded or failed. Um, in other cases, like this Google supremacy paper that, that, that's uh, just on the verge of coming out, it's a very statistical sort of thing. And so it's like, um, there's a guy named Scott Aronson, who's a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, who wrote a, uh, a really fabulous, blog posting just over the last couple of days describing quantum supremacy and, and what it means. And his analogy is, is that this first demonstration is like the Wright brothers flyer. You know, some people may have said, you know, heavier than air flight is impossible. And this wasn't yet an airliner, but it kind of proved that maybe, maybe they weren't quite right about it being impossible. But this statistical test is so difficult that it's kind of like, watching the Wright brothers flyer fly at a couple of centimeters height and trying to look at it and figure out whether it's really above the ground or not. So some of the problems, it's easy to tell when it's working right, and some of the problems, it's not. But this, that goes really to the core of, of computation. You know, we talk about, in, in theory, um, there are classical decision problems, and you've got you know, the computational classes P and NP, and, and right. You know, the, with those, the part of the definition of the computational class NP is that finding the answer is hard, but checking it's easy. If you're talking about a purely abstract problem, that's achievable. But if you're talking about something, a simulation of something in the real world, like a molecule or something where, for example, you're trying to calculate the ground state energy of, of a particular molecule, then the computation runs, and how do you verify that it works? Well, you do increasingly high precision experiments, and you see if the experiments and the simulation agree. Right, right. Now, in some worlds, that's not going to be easy. Exactly. Um, thinking in particular of financial or very large system interaction. Uh, you know, one of the things I constantly bump into is um, people who point out the following type of logic. Uh, quantum computing must be uh, real and short term because look at all the money that the intelligence community is spending on it. I have my own answer to that, but I like yours. 
as to whether it's real and coming well, soon. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the difference between, uh, I think, research that's dri driving towards a goal and something that w is going to yield a goal tomorrow morning. We are still at the stage where investing in quantum computing takes patience. That's definitely uh, the case. But there's been a tremendous amount of excitement in the last few years, and a bunch of venture capital money has started to flow in. Um, you know, the major governments have been investing in this for, for 20 years. Um, the, EU, the EU announced a big investment uh, a few years ago of a billion euros. The UK announced hundreds of millions of pounds in investment. The US government announced a billion dollar initiative. The Japanese government is putting in the equivalent of a couple of hundred million dollars in, in, into all of this. So there's government money, but within the last couple of years, there's also been venture capital money that's really started to flow in. And some of the investors and some of the companies are serious and are in this for the long term and understand that it's going to be years and years yet before these are machines that, that are, are, are actually changing the world. Some of the others are just getting excited over this word quantum and they're jumping up to, to, to invest in it and, and take advantage of it, including some of the startup companies. So some of the startup companies are being created by serial entrepreneurs with no actual quantum background. Some of them are being, are being created by quantum people with no experience in creating companies. And some of them are sort of sitting at that boundary, you know, in sort of the sweet spot. We are reportedly already starting to see the first shakeout of, of those venture-funded uh, startups. You know, the first round of money that a lot of those companies got was, was a couple of years ago, and it's usually a couple of years worth of money. And so the first round of money is starting to, 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 to be spent, and the investors are having to make the hard decisions about whether or not to put in more money. And in some cases, they will, and the companies will go on, and they'll produce something good and useful. And in some cases, they're going, well, you know, financial conditions have changed, or you didn't hit your technology milestones, or whatever, and so they're starting to pull back, and, and some of the, the companies are already starting to uh, suffer in, in that sense. That's inevitable. There are some people in the quantum community who think it's still too early to be investing in this, and that they think that having a lot of money flowing in right now is going to result in, in a big bust after this big boom and that it will taint quantum and that you know, like the AI winters of, of the late 80s and the 90s and, and whatnot that will be decades in recovering getting that money back into the field. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think now is a good time to be investing in this and building something, but you have to be aware that, that this is not going to be 18 months to, you know, nine months to a product, 18 months to revenue, and um, an exit in three to five years. You know, this is a much longer term play in that sense. Which uh, suggests that governments and very large companies will be the main players. Um, uh, Ginny Romady, who is the chairman and CEO of uh, IBM, uh, visited KO last year. and. Um, she has also been on the record as saying that after some number of years, and I forget what the number of years was she specified, she said, if quantum computing isn't a success, after n years there will be no IBM. You know, she believes, and the board of IBM believes, and the top technologists of, of IBM believe that, that it's one of the key technologies for the coming decades. And if you're building a long-term strategy, you have to be involved in it. And, and if you're not in it and you're not involved, you are putting your company at risk. Right. So actually, that actually sort of ties into why we have been pretty successful here at KO in bringing in companies to work with us on, on this. There's always sort of this stereotype of Japanese companies as being very conservative, and some of them have been in business for hundreds of years. But you don't stay in business for, uh, for hundreds of years without having a long-term vision. And so these people may be conservative, but part of being conservative is I'm going to protect the future of my company, and in this case that means investing in something that is potentially high risk and potentially high payoff. Right. As opposed to uh, something will pay off in the next quarter on earnings and my stock options will be more valuable. Exactly. Which tends to be the U.S. perspective too often. Exactly. Uh, so you, you were asking earlier about when 
the quantum computers will really sort of start to affect the world. Um, for example, Microsoft has a big effort in, in, in quantum computing. They've, they've been doing um, a lot of work. They have a lot of people in it. One of the problems that they like to talk about as a potential application of this comes from the quantum chemistry domain. Um, the fixation of nitrogen for making fertilizers for agriculture. The primary way of doing that is the uh, Bausch-Haber process. Am I pronouncing that right? Um, it's one of the most common industrial processes in, in the world. And that consumes today 1% to 2% of all of the energy we create on the entire planet goes into making agricultural fertilizer. And there are aspects of the chemical reaction that are not fully understood. So if you can take a quantum computer and you can apply it to that quantum chemistry problem and you can understand the transitions of that chemical reaction from one state to another state better, you may be able to, to reduce the amount of energy that's required or you may be able to even find better or easier to manufacture chemical fertilizers for agriculture. So Microsoft goes really big picture on this. The reason for investing in quantum computing is we're doing this to save the planet and to help humanity. Okay. Um, let me ask another question, which is close to my heart in some sense. <laughs> uh, for years, I've wanted to create what I call a time vault, mm. okay? where I can take all, the, um, all my memories of what's going on in the field put them into a time vault, which I arranged to open in 25 years, when all the people involved are dead, right? Uh, similar in, in some sense to what the UK do, tends to do. The problem usually, as usual, is obviously I want encrypted. I want to use public keys so I can distribute those keys to everybody. Mm -hmm. So in 25 years, I pop up the private key and everybody can work on it. They can all make up. Quantum computing, quantum cryptography is a real challenge to that because the general comment is how do you know in, uh, that in 10 years you're not going to be able to break it? Okay. Uh, are we getting any place, this may be a little off your area, but not, not completely. Are we getting any place in uh, cryptographic algorithms that are robust against quantum computing? As it happens, there's an entire field of what's called post-quantum cryptography, most of which uh, seems to be investing its time in trying to find a replacement for public key uh, exchanges and for the Diffie-Hellman key, key exchange. By and large, I've been happy to let other people work on this problem. It's, the field's been around for 10, 15 years. There's a series of conferences that's held on it. But just as a, a confluence of factors have come in in the last few months in my life, you know, the, your professional life that people have been working on. So I've been studying this over the last few months a little bit. Um, NIST, the National Institute of Science and uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States, is running in competition right now for what they call post-quantum cryptography. They're looking for a replacement for PKI. And they had, these numbers are going to be off. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but tens, dozens of applicants in the first round and they winnowed them down to a second round and now they're, they're doing the process of winnowing down going on forward and what they're trying to find is something that will be computationally intractable for, for quantum computers. There are some researchers who are in the quantum field who think that you're really tilting against a windmill here or that you're chasing some sort of mirage you know, that, that once quantum computers are fully up and functional and running, that any sort of one-way function, any sort of that kind of thing that's easy to compute and hard to undo, that those will all fall to quantum, quantum computers. I'm a little less certain. I, you know, it's not really an area that, I've, that I understand at the mathematical level yet, but I think for at least the rest of our lifetimes, there's going to be some classical computation that's, go com that's going to be achievable that quantum computers can't solve. So I think we're doing pretty good in that respect. Um, one of the European agencies that recommends key lengths for public key cryptography 
la just last year bumped their recommendations, and they now have a tiered recommendation. If you want your data to be se secure for 10 years, you should use this key length. If you want it to be secure for 30 years, you should use that key length. If you want it to be secure for 30 to 50 years, you need to, to use that key length. And today, the standard most people are using for RSA for their public key cryptography is 2048 bits. And this newest recommendation is that if you want data to be secure for the long run, you should be using 15,000 bits for, yeah. for your key. That's big. That's big. Uh, that's, that's a huge jump in it, which suggests that they are being very conservative. Um, one of my friends, Joe Fitzsimon, uh, who's who was a professor in Singapore and has resigned his academic position to start a, a quantum computing related company. Um, he said recently that when you're talking about this, as technologists, when we're talking about building the machines and, and doing things, we want to be conservative about what we're promising people that, that we can actually build and do. But on the other hand, if you're playing defense from the side of the cryptographic agencies, you want to be very optimistic in your assumptions about what's going to happen right. in terms of both the hardware technology and algorithms. So you know, what's the most wildly optimistic scenario for, for a quantum computer? How good is that? All right, now let's design a quantum algorithm or a, a classical cryptographic algorithm that's secure in the case of that wildly optimistic scenario coming true. Reasonable, reasonable. Um, we're close to the end of this, uh, but um, let, me, let me ask a loaded, another loaded question. Okay? <laughs> now, one of the things we're doing here is trying to understand the impact of technology on civilization in general. Hence uh, the cyber civilization? Right, Research Center. Uh, what do you think the long-term impact is going to be on, on the world as we, as we learn how to do quantum computing? and becomes technically fe economical, I think is a nicer term than feasible. The really long-term impact, one of the areas I think it's going to have the, the biggest impact is in material science. It's going to affect our ability to design and build interesting materials you know, structured at the atomic level on up. It has the potential to, ha to, to help with understanding of some biological processes. Um, some of the ideas that we're, we're learning now seem to be affecting our understanding of even photos photosynthesis in chlorophyll even before we actually have quantum computers. Just what we have learned from the science is affecting our understanding of that process as well. Um, is it going to help us make some sort of AI that's going to you know, be the singularity or take over the planet or, or uh, bring some Terminator scenario or something <laughs> like, like that. I think all of that's really unlikely. Um, I think for the foreseeable future that those areas of quantum chemistry is one of the areas where it's going to have the biggest impact. There are a lot of people who are working on optimization problems and how quantum computers can help solve those, which affects everything from the shipment of goods around the world to, to the successful operation of the internet itself. Um, and there are people who are trying to do to solve AI related problems on, on this. How far are we going to get with all of it? That's a really good question. I'm not sure I have a really good answer for what I think is going to, to uh, but fundamentally look different about society in 30 to 50 years because of the existence of quantum computers. Yeah, it's an interesting <laughs> question which we can leave to the audience to <laughs> mull over. The, um, I suspect it will be much more than we think. And if you look at the, the adoption of technology all along, we've never been able to predict very much what it does to our society especially as it's, you know, I, I look at the, the evolution of communication networks and the, we, we were unable to, to really understand what was going to happen in the early days of the internet. Otherwise, we'd, as I like to say, we'd all be richer than Bill Gates, <laughs> right? No, we just didn't have a, a, an image of how rapidly it could evolve. 
Um, well, you know, they say that, that any exponential process the, the, that we always overestimate what the impact is going to be in the short run and underestimate what it's right. going to be in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to say, right? You, you've been involved in, in the internet and distributed computing since the very earliest days. I think this year is the 50th anniversary of what's called the mother of all demos, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And you give or take, and whether that was more hype than reality or, or, or what have you, and whether you agree or disagree, there were elements of the vision that, that the visionaries had 50 years ago, including you and, and some of the other people from, from the very beginning, that 50 years later, we still aren't completely there. Right. And yet also, you know, there's the, the, the famous line about, about internet-connected cell phones, smartphones in, in, in your pocket, and it says, you know, I, I've got this device in my pocket that has access to all of humanity's knowledge, and I use, use it to look at pictures of cats and get into arguments with strangers. Right. You know, it's, it's an effect that wasn't really strongly predicted years ago. That's right. And it's changed everything. It has. Dramatically. Uh, we're also now beginning to run into, I notice, more and more a world where um, the, the value of, of science and the value of this research is being questioned. But yet, if you actually look at the, the impact and the, the benefits of it, you know, we, we couldn't be doing what we're doing now, basically, without a lot of technology. And so you know, saying we could do without the technology, <laughs> or we could do without the research, because that may yield things which we don't like as a society, is a dangerous game. Oh, I completely agree. And the academic world is a wonderful place to do that. This technology, not just quantum computing, but technology no, and research in, in, in general, yeah. It's an investment we must make in the future. There are people who are worried about the carrying capacity of the planet, and they're worried about the invasion of privacy, and they're worrying about you know, the chemicals that are used out of industrial processes, and the idea that we could go back to, to some agrarian Eden uh, of several thousand years ago, and that the whole world was, was much more wonderful than doesn't exist. I would not probably not have made it to the age of 20 without, without the existence yep. of modern medicines and you know, what we do with, with public health and with technology for supporting hum human life and for everything we've got. We must continue the investment in, in research and we must continue to push forward on, on this because there's no going back. Backwards is, is not an answer. It's not a feasible answer. No. Agreed. Well, I want to thank you. I think we've had a marvel I've had a marvelous time. I hope you have. <laughs> I and always enjoy talking to you. Yeah, it looks fun. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>